OK, so this is a lecture that I've uh, borrowed from Gary Oppliger. It's uh, our uh, applied geophysics uh, initial lecture on, on gravity. We'll have two. And uh, really, um, in this class, we're just going to concentrate on the, um, on the practical aspects of uh, measuring and interpreting uh, gravity measurements and uh, gravity anomalies. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about um, you know, crustal compensation, uh, the planetary gravity field at least very much, um, or for instance how uh, we look at gravity anomalies uh, uh, from uh, satellite orbit data. Okay? Those are all topics that are covered in, uh, um, in uh, GPH333. Uh, um, and also uh, to some extent in uh, in GPH uh, um, four fifty five, so um, that's uh, uh, not uh, necessary to cover them in this class. Uh, I do have some uh, notes on the planetary aspects that uh, I can give you if you haven't had the opportunity to take uh, GPH uh, three thirty three, um, which is um, you know at least those aspects could be considered a prerequisite for this class. But really here, uh, uh, everything you need to know about um, uh, how to actually measure and interpret uh, uh, gravity readings for, um, you know, for geological and engineering interpretations um, we'll give you right here. Now, um, you'll, you've no doubt noticed that there's a whole bunch of lectures on seismic techniques, um, maybe more than 10. Uh, where I'm just giving two lectures on gravity and two lectures on uh, magnetics, okay, and that doesn't really uh, uh, that doesn't really come from um, any any uh, uh, smaller utility of uh, gravity or magnetic measurements, uh, even for what I do, even though I emphasize seismic uh, in in everything I do. Um, you know, gravity and magnetics have been extremely important and crucial uh, parts of the uh, of the surveys that that I've done, the surveys that this class has done, and so forth. So, um, really, this reflects uh, uh, just uh, you know this instructor's lack of expertise in uh, gravity and magnetics, um, and my desire to um, to teach you what I know anyway, uh, which is to um, uh, take you further uh, than uh, most of these courses go at this level uh, in uh, in seismic techniques and uh, give you that special expertise that I have. And to do that, I have to give you kind of a short shrift on um, on gravity and magnetics. But uh, maybe that is uh, is appropriate considering who you're taking this class from. So uh, I don't consider that this is really uh, uh, you know, totally adequate coverage of, of gravity, gravity and magnetics, but uh, you know, what can we what can we do? Um, this is, uh, 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 I think, uh, uh, adequate uh, for uh, when you're considering gravity as as one of the one of the tools in your toolbox, which is uh, uh, how we have to think about everything here. Uh, you know, we apply uh, the appropriate tools. And uh, even though I cover uh, seismic uh, more heavily in this particular course as I teach it, um, that doesn't mean that there's anywhere that, that you can uh, rely on seismic entirely. Okay? Um, and, and it's really by putting methods together that we can really solve problems. All right, with that introduction, uh, we're on a, uh, a lecture that, Gre that Gary Oppliger designed when he uh, was teaching here several years ago. Uh, and he taught a uh, course in um, uh, mining exploration geophysics, uh, which uh, this is one of the uh, overheads he developed for that course. I've got to thank him for that. And uh, this, the lecture notes, uh, the uh, PDFs and the PowerPoints are available from a uh, kind of a, a website with an unlisted number um, that uh, I'll give you uh, the location of, and you can download them. Um, but um, um, I, I've only recently gotten uh, permission from Gary to uh, 
you know, to directly post these on an open public website. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, I had hidden the uh, uh, I had hidden the, the location of these uh, uh, these lectures before. Um, so uh, that's one of the benefits of taking this class is uh, that uh, you get to see these lectures that Gary uh, kindly uh, designed and lets me use. Um, so, uh, you know, I said this would be a, a practical uh, uh, a review of the practical aspects of, of measuring and interpreting gravity anomalies. So, how do we measure gravity? Uh, we can make absolute measurements. We can make relative gravity measurements. Um, and there's also um, uh, devices called gravity gradiometers. All right. Um, gravity used to be measured using a, a long pendulum uh, and timing the uh, uh, the swings of that pendulum with uh, with big accuracy. Um, so there there are historical gravity measurements made uh, uh, using uh, uh, using pendula. Um, there are uh, absolute uh, gravity uh, uh, gravity meters uh, that use a uh, falling corner cube reflector with uh, uh, the timing of, of the fall uh, uh, being um, uh, being uh, uh, measured by uh, uh, the the falling mass uh, um, cutting the uh, uh, cutting laser. Uh, uh, laser beams, and the um, the falling mass uh, is um, uh, has been designed for uh, mostly uh, indoor use, uh, but there are uh, some falling mass uh, absolute uh, gravity uh, devices that uh, that can be taken uh, into the field, and those are uh, you know demonstrating about. Um, uh, 0.5 percent, half a uh, half of one percent of a uh, milligal, about five microgals of precision. Now we'll we'll talk a little bit later about uh, what a, uh, a Galileo is, and um, uh, and and what we're uh, you know the the scale that we're measuring on. Uh, relative gravity measurements. Uh, that's the kind of measurement that we're going to make. Um, these are des these are a, a really a brilliant design of what's called a zero length spring, okay, and um, that means that it's uh, uh, you know reasonably accurate over a huge range of spring extensions. Uh, yet, um, um, you know, we can take advantage of that uh, uh, relative accuracy uh, to uh, to basically weigh a small mass. And that gives us a, uh, a relative, uh, uh, you know, that weight uh, gives us a, uh, since the mass doesn't change, of course, that weight gives us a, a relative measurement. Um, the zero length spring um, uh, essentially uh, has that uh, extra accuracy along its entire, uh, you know, range of extension, which means uh, over the very short range that it's actually used to measure. It has this incredible precision that we can uh, take advantage of. Um, we have a uh, Lacoste and Romberg uh, relative uh, gravimeter uh, with its uh, original design of uh, um, of the zero length spring, done by John Fett, um, who uh, uh, used uh, a few years ago he was uh, retired up in uh, Incline Village, um, and still uh, still innovating. Um, so uh, uh, ours is a was uh, our gravimeter was was made back in the uh, in the nineteen sixties. Um, we're you know even classes uh, like you are are able to use it to uh, a relative precision of four percent of a milligal zero point oh four milligal. Uh, we can demonstrate that. We'll probably demonstrate it again this spring. Um, so it's uh, quite good. Um, but there are, of course, uh, new uh, gravimeters. Um, back about uh, fifteen or twenty years ago, uh, Lacoste and Romberg was uh, was bought out by by Syntrex in uh, Canada, 
and uh, their uh, CG5 meter is is now the uh, kind of standard instrument. Uh, you know, unless uh, if you want to buy a new instrument, that's what you uh, that's what you have to get, and it's quite good. It's 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 better than the old Lacoste and Romberg precision. Um, gravity gradiometers are um, uh, quite an amazing uh, device, um, and uh, there's the uh, BHP Falcon Five, uh, which will get you a single a gradient of gravity in a single direction, and then there's the uh, Bell Geospace FTG, which was actually designed by uh, Lockheed Martin and uh, is still being produced by them. Uh, this this gets you uh, extremely accurate um, uh, measurements of the uh, gravity gradient, uh, and with the the Lockheed Martin one, that's in uh, full. That's a full tensor of uh, gravity gradients. Uh, so um, whatever kind of um, uh, gravity meter we have, that means that we are able to do certain kinds of surveys. So um, we. Uh, um, <clears throat> we can make measurements on the on the ground surface on land uh, with our Lacoste and Romberg uh, static um, relative gravimeter. Um, there are uh, borehole gravimeters. I'll show you a picture of one in a bit, uh, and those are also static gravimeters, and they can make measurements of gravity down a down a borehole. Um, now. Um, um, because we have to have a stable platform for our uh, um, our Lacoste and Romberg uh, uh, gravimeter, we can't make measurements on the ocean surface. We can't make measurements on on seas, and even uh, you know we do not have any gravity measurements uh, on uh, across Lake Tahoe, across Pyramid Lake, uh, any of the lakes uh, around here. We don't know what the gravity is uh, uh, out. Uh, you know any distance from shore, um, so uh, you know some some you know very uh, uh, very dedicated people have uh, uh, have uh, figured out how to remotely operate a gravity meter uh, after sinking it to uh, uh, the ocean or lake bottom, um, and uh, or, or I think uh, some gravity measurements have been made in bathyscaphs, um, you know diving bells, um, but. Um, uh, marine gravity is collected every day now um, using uh, dynamic gravimeters, which are the uh, uh, gradiometers. Okay, these days, and uh, we've even figured out how to make uh, gravity measurements uh, from aircraft. So, if we could afford it, we would fly uh, an airborne gravity gravity gradiometry survey uh, over our local lakes, uh, and. Um, but uh, so, so we're trying to figure out how to get uh, the resources to do that. Um, now, um, here's a, a picture of an absolute gravity meter. Uh, this yellow, uh, um, couple of yellow uh, uh, cylinders here contain an evacuated tube. And the, uh, uh, the falling corner cube reflector is released inside there. And, and there are, there's a series of laser beams that get reflected by that. Uh, Falling corner cube, and the timing of uh, when it when it breaks the different beams at the different distances down, uh, that's what's used to um, um, to get you uh, uh, not only absolute gravity but also the absolute gravity gradient, uh, at least in the vertical direction. Right, uh, this is only uh, capable of getting the gravity gradient in the vertical direction since it's a uh, a falling cube. Um, this uh, uh, this instrument gives uh, ten micro Galileo, which is uh, uh, zero point oh one uh, oh milligal precision, in you know less than ten minutes of operation at a quiet site. You drop the cube uh, uh, many 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 times and average the results and and look for that um, you know lack of uh, 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 lack of of uh, of noise in the results to decide uh, how accurate you're you're getting it. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a couple of places locally where this uh, gravimeter has been uh, has been deployed, and and uh, where we have uh, uh, you know absolute value, absolute gravity values, uh, and absolute gravity gradient values. 
Uh, here's a, a view of a uh, dynamic uh, platform gravity meter. Um, this is a gravity gradiometer. Uh, you can see that this is quite a, a complex machine. Um, the uh, rotating table of accelerometers is, um, is inside the, uh, the white box in the middle. Um, and that's uh, gimbaled uh, to keep it uh, uh, as isolated from the moving platform as, uh, as is possible. Of course, you know you can't um, uh, you know you can't completely isolate it from uh, all vibrations and and all uh, um, and, and and all uh, uh, motions of the uh, of the vehicle. Uh, you know whether it be ship or uh, or airplane. But um, uh, you know the better you isolate it, and the uh, uh, you know the more stable the vehicle, the the more accuracy you'll get in your uh, um, in your in your readings. Uh, this particular one, uh, which I don't know if it's still manufactured, uh, the uh, micro G Lacoste, is uh, capable of uh, of an accuracy, but from a moving platform, of one to five milligauss per minute. Okay, so that doesn't sound like great accuracy, but the fact that you can mount this in an airplane or on a ship is what's uh, uh, really groundbreaking about it. And here's uh, the current, um, currently available uh, land gravity meter, um, the uh, uh, the Syntrex uh, CG5 Autograv. Uh, it's much easier to operate than our Lacoste and Romberg. Uh, you know, like the uh, Lacoste and Romberg, a complete, uh, um, you know, an absolute standard uh, for uh, relative uh, gravity measurements. Okay. And so um, uh, that must be a, a, a leftover, an error there. Uh, we don't uh, we don't put this on moving platforms. Uh, we use it on the ground surface. Uh, it does uh, auto level. It does um, um, it does uh, uh, notice uh, how stable it can get, and will wait to make measurements uh, for when vibrations have died away. It auto locks. Uh, you know, you've already had some training with our. Lacoste and Romberg, where it's possible to uh, damage the instrument if you simply uh, lift it up without the uh, the spring being locked down. So, um, uh, you know, these are uh, terrific devices. Uh, you just uh, set it on the ground and push a button, and uh, within five minutes you'll have your uh, your measurement, uh, and it'll be all logged with uh, with very accurate elevation. That's a little GPS antenna on the uh, on the back of it there. Um, so um, I, I would love to, uh, you know, supplement our uh, Lacoste and Romberg, uh, which, you know, cost twenty five thousand dollars back in uh, about nineteen seventy five. Um, you know, that would be uh, these days that would be uh, half a million dollars. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, in in constant dollar terms, the price of these has come down because we can buy a brand new Syntrex CG5 for about a hundred thousand. Um, but uh, you know, we don't have the we don't have the money right now to to get that. This is just a picture of a borehole gravity meter uh, with its um, uh, protective uh, casing uh, cylinder taken off it. Um, it's uh, essentially. Uh, uh, a uh, uh, a tube where the uh, a, a, a static gravity meter is used inside the tube and and raised uh, within the tube itself. Um, so uh, you know the 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 sond uh, of the uh, of the uh, borehole gravity meter is is essentially uh, just a way of of isolating the uh, uh, the uh, the gravity meter uh, itself uh, from the, uh, the you know the borehole environment, which is uh, you know high pressure and very wet, um, and so uh, uh, it's uh, uh, you know raised to a uh, uh, a certain uh, level of the borehole, and um, and then uh, the gravity meter inside is uh, is able to travel uh, more than a meter uh, within the. Uh, within the sonde itself, uh, this is a, a very uh, 
a high accuracy way of making uh, rock density measurements. Um, and this was done um, back in the 70s and 80s to such an extent that uh, there's a lot of good correlation data now between uh, um, between uh, uh, geophysical uh, logging tools, uh, which uh, purport to measure density. Um, you know, they're, they're density tools. Um, but they don't really measure density. They measure some proxy, you know, um, apparent uh, cross-sectional density, uh, uh, cross-sectional uh, density of, of hydrogen uh, nuclei, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's enough comparative data now that um, I think uh, Sandia Labs has told me, uh, one of my former students there, that they have uh, um, they have four or five of these uh, borehole gravity meters, uh, which haven't been used in 20 or 25 years, um, and would be very expensive to uh, refurbish and and uh, uh, and be able to use for for measurements again. So, um, uh, at least in the uh, in oil fields, uh, there's uh, so much comparative data that uh, there's no point in using an actual borehole gravity meter anymore. So. Uh, uh, this is the uh, the Bell uh, uh, platform for uh, you know here it is uh, uh, you know in a uh, in a blimp uh, a helium filled blimp uh, over uh, Cape Town and the uh, Table Mountain that's behind Cape Town there um, measuring gravity in the air you know of course uh, blimp is a nice uh, stable platform but this uh, 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 Lockheed Martin uh, uh, rotating uh, uh, table uh, with these two uh, accelerometer pairs, um, uh, you know, on that table that uh, that you can use to uh, measure the whole tensity uh, uh, gravity gradient, whole tensor gravity gradient field, uh, and um, it's good and it's accurate enough, and um, you know, with all the gimbling and and everything, uh, you can put it on a ship. You can even put it on a small airplane. Um, you know, you don't get very good, uh, uh, you know, in, in rough seas and, and in rough weather in the airplane. You don't get measurements that are that accurate, but, um, uh, you know, with a little uh, luck, uh, you, you, uh, you know, and smooth, uh, smooth sailing, uh, you can get uh, accurate, you can get accurate enough measurements. So uh, this is quite a, um, <clears throat> Uh, quite a well-used uh, uh, platform these days. Uh, they package this uh, Bell packages it together with lidar and you know uh, ultra accurate GPS, uh, you know uh, kinematic GPS, rather like what we're using, and um, you can get it flown for uh, you know I think it's less than a hundred dollars per uh, uh, per line mile, and um, so it, it is a, an incredibly efficient way of measuring gravity and and uh, and directly measuring gravity gradients um, uh, over huge areas. Uh, so we just need to get it done uh, here in uh, in northern Nevada on our lakes. Now, uh, gravity meter is whether it's relative or absolute. Uh, it's measuring the local vertical component of the uh, of the total gravitational field. Okay, so um, then and there are uh, there are two parts to that uh, total gravitational field. There's the gravitational acceleration uh, that's brought about by the mass of the Earth, and then there's the dynamic acceleration field. You know, the uh, you have to subtract the centrifugal force of the uh, uh, of the rotation of the Earth. Okay, the centrifugal acceleration. So um, uh, you know those are uh, those are added together, and um, um, but uh, one thing that's uh, you know especially compared to magnetic and electrical measurements, one thing that's very simple about gravity is that the uh, uh, you know we define the vertical by uh, by looking for the maximum um, the maximum uh, uh, gravity. So the direction where we find the maximum gravity that defines what we mean by vertical. Okay. And it doesn't always point, you know, directly at the uh, center of mass of the Earth, um, and so that uh, that can be an interesting series of uh, of measurements itself, you know, which way it points. But uh, we don't have to worry about uh, 
you know, taking our, our measurement, um, you know, on some, on some direction other than the vertical because our measurement is defined to be on the vertical. So, you know, maybe, maybe that's just a, a piece of convenience there, but, um, uh, you know, it does, does make the interpretation of gravity measurements a lot easier. We, we're not worried about the direction of the gravity gradient uh, in, 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 you know, our static, in measuring our, uh, with our static gravity meters. Um, because uh, the direction they're measuring is is what we we define to be uh, to be vertical, so uh, so everything lines up uh, uh, just fine. So um, uh, you know if you're if you're sitting at the uh, at the uh, surface of the Earth and there's some heavy ore body uh, you know to the side of you, that's going to add a little bit of extra pull to the to the side, and that's going to uh, you know. Uh, the combined gravity field is is not going to point quite to the center of mass of the Earth, and it'll be slightly away. And we're just measuring that uh, vertical component of the uh, you know. Eventually, we're going to try to isolate the uh, uh, the pull uh, the you know the excess pull of that excess mass, and uh, we're going to get the vertical component, just the red arrow, instead of the you know the the actual uh, uh, pull of just that mass in isolation, which would be F B. Okay, uh, we're going to get that vertical component uh, instead. But since that vertical component is in the vertical direction, no problem. Um, so uh, you know, going back to uh, you know basic physics, and and uh, you, know, you might have seen this before, this as well in uh, uh, in in the uh, uh, GPH three thirty three class. Okay. Uh, the gravitational uh, acceleration, you know, due to a, uh, a point uh, mass or or a sphere, okay, uh, you know, and and looking at that regarding that sphere as having its mass concentrated entirely at the uh, at its center and center of mass, all right, uh, you know, the acceleration a is equal to the universal gravitational constant big G times the mass of the of the sphere divided by the distance from the center uh, of mass squared. Okay. Um, now, uh, you know, putting the units together on this, the acceleration, of course, has uh, units of distance per per second per second or distance per second squared. And uh, we've defined the SI unit. That's a it's a fully official SI unit. One gal. Notice the capital G on the abbreviation to the unit is equal to one Galileo, right? So Galileo is a proper name, uh, and the unit's named after Galileo, but uh, uh, you only capitalize it when you use the abbreviation, right? So one Galileo uh, spelled out is with a small g, and then um, uh, that's defined to be uh, an acceleration of one centimeter per second squared. So most places at the Earth's surface, uh, uh, the the acceleration of gravity, which we call little g, okay, is is about 980 Galileos, okay, 980 gal. So, uh, I, or I might just say a thousand gal, right? So, uh, if we are uh, if if the acceleration in total is uh, if g in total is is a thousand gal, and we're making measurements with an accuracy of one milligal. That means we're making a, a physical measurement, right? We got to measure the length of that spring, okay? Uh, we're making a physical measurement that has one part per million accuracy. Now we're we're really used to being able to count frequency and and measure time, you know, down to way better than a part per million. But to to make any other kind of measurement, uh, you know, a physical measurement of voltage or or uh, you know, here we're making a measurement of weight. Um, or, or uh, even uh, even length, very hard to make a physical measurement with one part per million accuracy. And that's why that's why gravity surveying is is such a uh, uh, such a ticklish business. Uh, now um, we have to include the uh, the effect of Earth's rotation, and we do that by um, accounting for the ellipsoidal shape of the of the Earth. You know, if the Earth is at least on a on a very you know million year time scale, uh, the uh, shape of the Earth behaves as if the Earth was a fluid. So um, you know when you get closer to the equator, 
uh, and you're rotating faster. Well, your your rotational um, velocity is the same, but your uh, your lateral velocity is uh, is larger. So there's a larger centrifugal force, and that causes the Earth to bulge around the equator. Um, so the uh, uh, the equatorial radius a of the Earth is is uh, 20 kilometers larger than the polar radius uh, b of the Earth. Now that's 20 kilometers out of uh, um, out of uh, uh, 6,300, right? So it's not very much, and certainly a lot less than than this exaggerated diagram here. Uh, but it's still, uh, uh, you know, well worth keeping track of. So the um, uh, the gravitation uh, uh, at your uh, uh, at, at wherever you're measuring it is equal to um, uh, the equatorial gravity times this uh, this factor that's to the right of it. It's um, it's uh, uh, one plus uh, um, uh, a uh, a constant f one times the uh, um, uh, the sine of theta plus another constant f two times, and I think that's supposed to be sine squared theta. Sorry about that uh, that problem there. Um, and the and uh, the uh, GE, uh, the gravity of the equator, is uh, uh, I mean there's a value out to about uh, seven digits, but um, it's uh, about 978 gals, um, and uh, theta is the latitude. So uh, you know f1 and f2 depend on the uh, the flattening of the Earth, uh, you know the rate of rotation. Um, it depends on uh, some aspects of the density distribution of uh, within the Earth, and the uh, centrifugal forces of rotation. So, um, all right, that's enough about uh, global gravity. You know, we're gonna we're gonna look for gravity anomalies. You know, which are uh, uh, differences in gravity that uh, that depend on uh, uh, on where you are and, and are caused by by interesting uh, uh, geological or engineering. Uh, Phenomena, you know, close to the surface. You know, we're we're not really looking uh, that far down into the crust uh, in the work that we'll do. So um, uh, we can uh, we can examine, we can survey for those density differences um, with uh, gravity surveys. Okay, and uh, so here's a basic outline for uh, how to do a gravity survey. You uh, collect uh, 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 gravimeter uh, readings, and you uh, you get the uh, the elevation of, of every station where you're collecting uh, gravimeter readings to um, uh, you know an accuracy of 25 centimeters or so. Okay, um, and I, I often say you know one foot is is about good enough. Uh, that's 30 centimeters. And then you link the uh, 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 their field readings into a gravity reference network. That gravity reference network has, you know, known values of the of the tidally corrected uh, absolute gravity. You know, some some number, uh, you know, nine eighty uh, nine nine uh, um, um, nine seventy uh, uh, gals. Okay, and um, and so we get a, a and we, we usually express them in terms of milligals, so it'll be uh, you know almost a million uh, milligals at the uh, at the absolute gravity station. And then uh, we apply uh, reductions, okay, uh, for uh, you know relative elevations and other things to reduce the absolute gravity absolute gravity value absolute acceleration value to a what's called a simple Bouguer anomaly, SBA, and complete Bouguer anomaly, CBA. So uh, then, uh, once we have a Bouguer anomaly, um, and Bouguer was a uh, uh, 18th century uh, French uh, uh, physicist and, and astronomer, um, once we have a Bouguer anomaly, we interpret it as a uh, uh, in terms of anomalous crustal density distributions. Or maybe instead of saying anomalous, I'll say interesting crustal density distributions. Uh, 
Now, what are we going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at uh, uh, a density anomaly, which is the uh, less dense rock in a basin compared to the more dense rock in the ranges. So where do we find those uh, absolute gravity values? Uh, we go to the, uh, the PACES uh, database at uh, University of Texas at uh, El Paso. And uh, we look up our area, and every area, you know, throughout the United States and 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 much, many areas in the world, there's a uh, international uh, gravity standardiz standardization net uh, station, IGSN 71. This was established in uh, uh, before 71 and published in 71. So it's a it's a set of stations that were uh, measured kind of all together in one campaign, and. Um, you know they they uh, um, took a certain number of uh, 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 a certain distribution of pendulum and uh, um, you know falling corner cube reflector uh, absolute gravity measurements, and then they used uh, Lacoste and Romberg uh, gravimeters just like ours to extend uh, you know using using the relative measurements uh, with Lacoste and Rombergs to uh, extend the absolute gravity coverage. And so there's 1,800 uh, reference stations, uh, uh, fewer uh, now, uh, because uh, you know some of them have been uh, destroyed. Um, but there, uh, there's about 1,800 reference stations uh, that uh, have this, uh, you know, um, stably uh, uh, characterized uh, absolute gravity, and the uh, you know the value is known, and its accuracy is known too. Okay, and here's the top part of the. Uh, of the of the data sheet uh, that describes the station, you can see that some values uh, have been handwritten in, um, and some information's been uh, corrected by hand. Um, and it says, uh, you know, where it is and how to get there, and and who's responsible for the site of the uh, station. They tend to be established in public buildings. Uh, we needed to locate a uh, absolute gravity reference in. Um, uh, near Hood River, and we found one uh, about uh, uh, half an hour's drive to the east. Uh, that was a, that was in a high school, and even though it was summer, we got the uh, the janitor to let us in uh, to the point inside the building where the uh, um, where the, uh, uh, the 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 gravity measurement the station existed. Okay, and all this description you see that that tells you how to. Uh, how to get to the building, and then where in the building it is. This is the one at Mammoth. Uh, all this you can find on the Paces uh, uh, website, uh, the uh, what Pan American Center for uh, uh, for Earth Studies, something like that. And so they have a database of of uh, uh, all this and more. Um, not just uh, it's a, it's an excellent database at Paces for. Uh, um, uh, for gravity measurements all over the all over uh, the Western Hemisphere, uh, not just these super accurate uh, base station uh, measurements, and you can see uh, they give the uh, uh, the gravity uh, uh, value, the absolute acceleration. Um, you know, and it's nine seventy nine at, at Mammoth, uh, uh, nine hundred seventy nine thousand uh, milligal, uh, and they give the uh, the uh, the uncertainty there at um, you know less than one percent of a milligal, uh, 0 0.004 uh, milligal, so very uh, uh, very nice there. Uh, here's uh, the the map in the data sheet from the the paces. It shows you uh, you know a little snippet of a topo map uh, you know showing where this building is, and then. Um, uh, a diagram of the building itself and uh, where the gravity, um, where the gravity station is inside the building. You can see it's in a stairwell, just like our one on in the SEM building here. So um, once you've uh, you've measured gravity and then tied it to the uh, um, uh, uh, and 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 you have a, a local base station available. Here's the procedures to you know how do you get from your field instrument readings to uh, absolute observed gravity. So you got to tie in uh, one, uh, at least one site, uh, which we'll call the field base in your, in your field survey area. You got to tie that to some IGSN 71 base station. Okay? Um, 
so we used the one at Mammoth when we were working in Mammoth. We um, and uh, hopefully there's one in uh, Yarrington that we can use uh, for our work uh, this uh, this semester uh, out by Schurz. So you occupy that uh, uh, that field base. Uh, uh, it's the first and last station occupied every day, and you also uh, occupy it several times during the day, uh, if possible. Um, now you use that to define instrument drift, right? The the uh, as the tide goes by, uh, you know, there's earth tide, um, which uh, you know was talked about in uh, GPH three thirty three. Um, you know, every uh, every uh, uh, six hours, you're going from a tidal uh, a tidal uh, maximum to a tidal minimum uh, in the earth tide. So, um, you know, if you um, if you measure every three or even better two hours, then um, uh, go back to your field base station. Then you can define uh, not only what the tide is doing in your area, uh, but also uh, what the instrument drift is. Okay, those those zero length springs they, you know they they change very slightly as you're as you're using them, especially if your, uh, you know if your if your gravimeter goes off temperature, then uh, then all bets are off. But uh, um, you know, even even with a stable temperature uh, and not jostling the instrument too much, um, you know, even when it's uh, even when it's locked down, if you jostle it too much, uh, you'll get some some drift in the in the spring constant. So you then you you uh, take the uh, the instrument reading, you know, the dial reading. You still got to, got to use the manufacturer's calibration table to uh, to get the 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 relative uh, acceleration in milligals, and um, so then um, you uh, you use your drift correction, uh, and you might also use uh, theoretical earth tides, uh, you know, from uh, 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 from a, a code that, that will calculate uh, earth tides, um, or the uh, the field base measured every three hours or less. Okay, so that'll remove earth tides, and then you um, you remove the drift with the uh, the daily base readings or the uh, you know the more frequent uh, base readings, and uh, then you shift relative to the uh, you know what you've brought into the field uh, uh, your your tie back to the uh, absolute gravity station, the uh, IGSN uh, station, and uh, uh, then you have a uh, an observed gravity value you know uh, an excel a total acceleration of gravity at each station, and that's the tide free full. Uh, vertical gravity um, value, uh, acceleration of gravity at each uh, station. Uh, note that to get there, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, that that to correct to do that correction and get to that uh, absolute gravity value. There's no, um, you, you don't need to bring in anything about the station elevation or or the station location. Um, you know, none of that is is. Uh, um, is is ne needed uh, to get the absolute gravity. You know, that's uh, that's mainly dependent on removing drift, removing tides, and uh, tying back to a, a station with known uh, absolute acceleration. Okay, so the second uh, part of it is uh, then how do you uh, how do you look for uh, gravity anomalies that tell you about the subsurface? Okay. So there's a set of standard physically predictable factors um, that, um, and, and most of them depend essentially on uh, you know elevation and topography. Okay, those uh, physically predictable factors, um, you know, we want to remove them from our absolute measurement, and um, uh, and we'll see uh, uh, what remains is going to be a gravity anomaly. You know, it's a it's a uh, uh, it's the part of our acceleration measurement that doesn't match the simple prediction of, of the gravity value, okay? Uh, and that's going to what going to be what indicates uh, some sort of density uh, anomaly, okay? So this this uh, you know correcting out these physically uh, predictable factors is the process called gravity reduction, okay? So if your gravity survey extends over more than hundred kilometers. Uh, of of uh, distance north to south, then you'll want to do a latitude correction, okay, 
and, and you can use uh, a, there's a number of geodetic reference formulas you can use for that, um, and uh, those are available uh, from Paces as well, um, and that will so you need you know some knowledge of the latitude of each of your stations uh, to make sure you can do the latitude correction. Now for our work, you know we're working entirely. Uh, over uh, distances of uh, less than, you know, way less than 100 kilometers, so we won't bother with the latitude correction. It's too small over the, uh, too small to worry about over the area that we'll be working. And then there's uh, an elevation correction, okay? Um, and there's uh, that elevation correction comes in two varieties, and we need to apply them both. Uh, there's the free air correction and the Bouguer slab correction, okay? And those depend on our elevation relative to some some data. Okay, if we're working all across uh, you know a state, we're probably gonna gonna want to set a datum that's uh, that's say sea level. All right, um, and uh, and that would be a, a standard thing to do uh, in in making that uh, um, uh, you know correcting out uh, elevation for uh, um, uh, for getting. Uh, uh, Gravity anomalies. All right. Um, in our, you know, working in our small field area, you know, right around Schurz, we're going to take uh, whatever, you know, whatever, wh whichever one of our gravity stations ends up having the lowest elevation, uh, you know, in, in, in our field area. That's where we'll set our, our data. We'll set a datum elevation to be uh, uh, to be the uh, the elevation of the lowest station that we have in our area. So that uh, our, we'll have a local datum, and um, and we'll do our elevation corrections just relative to our local datum. We won't correct. We won't bother to correct all the way back to sea level. Okay. Uh, then there's a so-called uh, terrain correction. All right, which is not really the elevation of our gravity measurement. It's the uh, it's what what does the terrain look like around it? You know, are there hills nearby? Are we on the side of a hill? Are there valleys nearby? You know, are we uh, are we overlooking a valley? Okay, um, and the terrain correction also comes in two varieties. Uh, there's the different rings that I've explained to you uh, uh, in the in the gravity uh, the gravity field tutorial. Um, the inner rings uh, are are you know are not usually the the terrain is not present in the uh, the digital elevation models and the other data we use uh, uh, that we have available to us. So the inner rings, you know, say within 175 feet of our uh, of our gravity measurement, uh, we we estimate the terrain correction right in the field, and we don't leave the field until we have an estimate of it. Uh, the farther rings, we uh, we compute, uh, you know, using a code, um, either um, Oasis Montage or uh, there's a uh, an open source code that I found. Uh, Montage is turning out to be kind of a nightmare to um, to use and and uh, has a huge uh, steep learning curve. So um, this this other code we found, uh, uh, which is very simple, uh, is just fine for computing the uh, uh, computing the uh, the outer ring terrain corrections. Uh, now, according to uh, my colleagues at the USGS. If we just use the field estimated uh, inner ring terrain corrections, and, and you know we apply a latitude correction, we apply an elevation correction, we apply uh, then only the inner rings of the field observed uh, terrain correction. Uh, putting all that together and getting a Bouguer anomaly is called a simple Bouguer anomaly. And then uh, doing the uh, the computation to get bring in the farther rings, uh, you know beyond 175 feet from the station. Uh, for the uh, the terrain correction, uh, that's making that full correction is called a complete Bouguer anomaly, or CBA. Okay, uh, and occasionally uh, we'll need to make an isostatic correction. Um, you know, if we're trying to look for uh, you know density variations in the Sierra and Route, well, the Sierra Nevada are in places uh, isostatically compensated or or uncompensated. And that uh, that may need to be adjusted for. Uh, for our work, we're not going to we're not going to do that. So we're going to um, um, we're going to accomplish uh, uh, the elevation correction, free air and bouguet, and uh, we're also going to uh, 
uh, do the inner ring, inner ring terrain corrections in the field, and calculate civil Bouguer anomalies. And uh, you'll also learn how to uh, use Oasis Montage uh, to calculate the uh, the farther uh, uh, the farther rings. So uh, you know this with all these corrections, uh, the reduced gravity uh, leaves us with a gravity anomaly. Okay, here's a little bit on the latitude correction. Uh, uh, you know, just saying that uh, you can use the uh, the GRS eighty uh, four, uh, the geodetic uh, uh, reference system, uh, nineteen eighty four, uh, for this. Um, that's uh, also shown on the Paces website there. Um, and uh, you know that uh, that formula will give you what's called a normal gravity, a g sub n. Okay, so uh, that includes the latitude correction, and uh, so we can get our anomaly, our anomalies relative to that normal gravity. All right. So then, after correcting for normal gravity, um, we uh, we then want to um, get the gravity corrections for our uh, uh, to our uh, um, to our datum. You know uh, this uh, in this uh, figure here, where you know it's assumed that the the datum elevation is going to be the uh, mean sea level. Um, so if we have uh, uh, you know if we're correcting uh, to uh, to mean sea level, and our stations at mean sea level, you know which we uh, actually have done. Uh, um, you know one easy way to uh, um, to get uh, uh, to get a gravity. Uh, uh, to get an elevation for a gravity measurement is to take the take the measurement on the beach, uh, uh, you know, knowing where uh, mean sea level is on that beach. All right, that's a, a very simple way of doing it. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, then we're done if uh, if we uh, if we have uh, uh, a measurement made at our datum elevation. Okay, but uh, you know our our. Uh, our stations might be above or below the uh, uh, the datum elevation, and so we got to do the elevation corrections. Okay, uh, so uh, for a station above the uh, uh, the datum, right? Um, there's uh, uh, it's it's also further from the center of the Earth. So you know if we took a if we took a, a gravity station uh, a gravity measurement. Um, uh, at mean sea level, okay, we get one value, and uh, if we then put our gra gravimeter up in a balloon, which is, has been done actually, um, you know, so there's no, there's no, you know, effectively air density, zero density between between sea level and uh, where we're making the measurement, right? Um, that's why it's called the uh, the free air correction. Okay, there's no density between the datum and our uh, uh, and and where we're making the measurement. Okay, so when we make a measurement, you know, on a hill above our datum, we know that's not true. But first, we do the uh, uh, the free we make the free air correction, uh, and later on, I'll show you the equation for that. Okay, uh, and then we um, uh, we also uh, correct for the uh, Bouguer slab. Okay, which which accounts for the mass, you know, of an infinitely extending uh, slab between us. And uh, um, and the uh, and the data, right? So um, we're um, we're at the uh, um, we're above the datum, and uh, there's all this extra rock uh, between us and the and the datum elevation. Okay, so we uh, and we have to make an assumption about what the density of that rock is. Okay. Uh, so maybe we're up in the Sierras and it's granite, and and it would be about two point six seven grams per cc. That's a very standard value. But if we're uh, if if the the rock between us uh, and and our datum elevation is a uh, a very light diatomite, uh, you know it might be substant. The Bouguer slab density might have to be much less than the standard two point six seven. Now, how does this go? Uh, you know, we're we're going to add on the uh, um, the free air correction, right? Because when we're up in that balloon, we're further from the center of the Earth, and so the uh, you know r r is greater and r squared is uh, is is greater. So um, uh, we get a uh, you know we're and the acceleration is divided by r squared. So we get a uh, 
uh, a smaller acceleration, a, a less there's less measurement when we're up, you know, up in the air above our uh, data. So uh, if we're located above our um, um, above the datum, we want to correct back to uh, uh, back to the datum, which means we've got to add. Okay, so you know on this slide the uh, the free error is added, right? So we take our observed acceleration, absolute acceleration, subtract the uh, the normal the normal gravity. Uh, if we're above the datum, we add the free error correction. Okay, or the free error correction is is uh, positive if we're above the uh, datum, and so it gets added. If we're below the datum, right, uh, we're closer to the center of the Earth, and the uh, uh, the measurement is greater than it would be at the datum. So, so in that case, the free error correction, you know, below the datum, the free error correction would be uh, negative. Okay, so it would actually get subtracted. All right, and then the uh, the Bouguer slab, right? Instead of just be, there being air, there's positive density between us and the datum. So uh, being above the datum, there's that extra rock there, and um, so the uh, Bouguer partly offsets the uh, the free air correction. It's actually uh, um, uh, the Bouguer correction is actually subtracted. Okay, so it, it counteracts, uh, but overall the elevation correction is going to be. Uh, is going to be positive uh, if we're above the datum uh, and get added, and um, uh, and it's going to be uh, negative and get subtracted if we're below the datum. Okay, from that uh, from that measurement. Uh, the terrain correction, as I explained, is is one of those things that is weird because it doesn't depend on the sign. Okay, so you know if 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 our gravity meter is being acted on by the hill. Uh, you know, which is here to the right. Okay, it's going to be pulling that spring up, and we'll get a lighter measurement than than we should have. So, to correct for the effect of that hill above where we're making the measurement, right? We have to add a value. Okay, and likewise, when the when we're overlooking a valley, which is here on the left, okay, there's missing mass, which is not pulling down on our on our uh, uh, on our uh, uh, gravity meter. So. Again, that that uh, is making the measurement lighter. So whether it's a hill above us or a valley below us, right? The terrain uh, it, correction is always added. Okay, the terrain the terrain correction is always a positive number. It's always added in to produce the uh, the Bouguer anomaly value. Uh, now, getting those inner rings, the A and B rings, you know, in the uh, that we want to do in the field. That means that right when we're measuring the gravity, right, to, and, and very often right when we're measuring the elevation of the gravity station, you know, we want to look at the terrain around us and make that uh, that inner ring uh, estimate, um, you know, within a distance of 175 feet. So here's a picture of the of the year 2000 class doing that uh, in Warm Springs Valley. Uh, and then, uh, as I showed you. Uh, you look at uh, page fourteen of the Telford book, and there's the uh, the terrain correction table, and you decide, uh, you know, in in each sector, you know, zone B has four sectors, zone C has six sectors, you know, and and within each distance range, you know, zone B is six and a half to fifty five feet away, and zone C is fifty five to one hundred seventy five feet away. Okay, you decide, uh, you know, what the the average elevation difference is, positive or negative, doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, right, so uh, plus or minus z, you figure out what your elevation difference is here in in the Telford book. This table, it's listed in feet, and then you read off the uh, the terrain correction uh, to add, always added for that sector uh, in uh, that's in milligals. So you know if uh, within 55 feet of you the hill goes up by 15 feet, well. There's going to be uh, seven percent of a milligal to add, you know, per sector. You know, if you've got, uh, if you're sitting at the bottom of a bowl, um, you know, in a pit, and it's 15 feet above you, uh, um, you know, all the way around, um, then uh, then you're going to have to add this uh, 0.067 four times. Okay. Um, likewise, if you're if you're on top of a mound, and it's 15 feet below you. Uh, you know, within uh, 
uh, average, uh, you know, within fifty-five feet, then uh, you're going to be uh, uh, adding exactly the same uh, terrain correction, and and it's always added whether the terrain is above or below you. Uh, but and, and by you, I mean where you're making the measurement. Okay, uh, and there's six sectors to uh, to zone C. Uh, you can see that uh, you know, let's say you're going for a, a gravity accuracy of 0.1 milligal. You know, if all your sectors are coming up with you know like 0 0.002 milligal terrain difference, then you can safely ignore it, right? Because no matter how you know how many sectors you have to add up, you're just not going to get to anywhere close to 0.1 milligal of terrain correction. But of course, you want to you want to note that down. You know, you want to you you may not add the correction; it might be too small to add, but uh, you still note down uh, uh, what it was just to prove that you didn't need to add it in. Uh, and then uh, notice that uh, zone B, you know, in the table here, it only goes down to zone B. Why aren't we uh, thinking about zone A, uh, which is uh, which is inside, uh, you know, closer to the to the measurement than the measurement spot than six and a half feet? Well, if you have to if you have to make a zone A uh, terrain correction, then it's it's really not a good not a good place to measure gravity, and you really want to avoid that. Um, now uh, you know if if you have a good one meter lidar and uh, and you can uh, uh, and you can mark on your lidar map exactly where you're making the measurement, then uh, you might be able to make uh, appropriate zone A measurements using a, a computer code. Um, uh, you know zone A terrain corrections. Um, so, uh, uh, but it's just much easier to. Uh, uh, in most situations where we don't have that lidar, much easier to pick an appropriate gravity station that doesn't require any zone A correction, and, um, and you know, which means it's pretty much flat uh, for at least six feet around the gravity meter, and then uh, uh, do the zone B and C uh, terrain corrections. Learn how to do them, you know, manually in the field, and always observe while you're out there. So then you. Um, you know, you you apply the uh, the inner ring terrain corrections. The USGS, uh, you know, says uh, all right, subtract the normal gravity from the absolute acceleration, g obs. Uh, add the uh, free air correction. That is, if you're, uh, which is which will be positive if you're if you're above the datum. Subtract the uh, Bouguer correction. It'll be, you know, it'll be su it'll be uh, subtracted if you're above the datum. Right, getting rid of that uh, extra rock between you and the datum. And uh, and then add the inner ring terrain corrections. You've got the simple Bouguer anomaly SBA, and then add the outer uh, ring terrain corrections. You know uh, uh, DEFG and so forth, um, and you'll have the complete Bouguer anomaly. Uh, here's a uh, a view of the complete Bouguer anomaly uh, throughout the uh, uh, continental U.S. I could probably spend a whole hour just talking about uh, the various anomalies. Uh, notice that uh, here in northern Nevada, uh, you know we're in a in a very light area. Um, uh, the uh, uh, we have a light Bouguer anomaly. It's going to be a negative number. Uh, I think it's just under negative two hundred uh, milligals. Um, and you've got to go out to the Sierra foothills where there's this line of uh, of uh, red here. Uh, positive. You know these are uh, much larger. Uh, uh, the the uh, um, it's it's red there because uh, you know it's a positive uh, uh, Bouguer anomaly. You know this is correcting everything to sea level, um, and that's due to uh, you know heavy rocks in the Sierra foothills. Uh, so this is uh, showing us basins, sedimentary basins. Uh, you can see the Anadarko basin there in in Oklahoma. You know a big uh, big hole in the uh, Bouguer anomaly. Uh, it's showing us uh, mantle convection. It's showing us subduction zones, showing us suspect terrains, showing us uh, failed rifts. Uh, you name it. Um, uh, there's a lot of interpretation to be made here, and uh, don't have time for that now. Now, what the the what uh, this slide is trying to answer is the question of uh, uh, that you might ask. Um, all right, so I correct my, I take my stations and I correct them down 
uh, using the free air and the bouguet and the terrain corrections. I, I correct them down below the topography and maybe all the way down to uh, sea level, uh, or at least maybe to uh, the elevation of my lowest station. All right. So uh, does that mean then that if I have, you know, say this uh, anomalous density body like a, a dike here that goes up into the topography, am I now, uh, you know, considering that density to be up above the station, and you know, then might it have a uh, might it be pulling, you know, that extra density? Could it be pulling up on uh, on my gravimeter as I as I've corrected it? And and that's not the case. Um, uh, all we're doing is we're uh, uh, you know, in doing the uh, terrain correction and doing the uh, the the elevation uh, reduction, the bouguet slab uh, reduction uh, to the uh, uh, to the, the simple bouguet anomaly and the complete bouguet anomaly. All that we've done is that we've assumed that the um, the we've left the stations in their original locations at their original uh, elevations, but we've um, uh, we've now said all right. They're sitting on a terrain of zero density down to sea level or down to the uh, uh, down to the datum, okay, our local datum if that's what we're using. So that's all we've done. There's no there's no extra funny business like this. Um, you know this this kind of stuff. Um, you know what are you actually correcting, um, and and are you actually moving the stations? Uh, that's actually uh, kind of a, a big deal in um, well in in. In seismic uh, uh, reductions uh, for uh, um, you know the varying elevations of stations and shots, uh, and also uh, in magnetics and electromagnetics, uh, you know you actually are uh, uh, maybe looking at uh, having your anomalous bodies above the stations after you've made certain corrections, uh, but that's not uh, that's not what happens in gravity. It's much simpler. Uh, no worries. Uh, easy to do. Okay. So, all right. I've been talking about anomalous densities and and getting and measuring gravity anomalies from uh, density anomalies. So we got to talk a little bit about density, right? Um, I'm certainly going to ask you about that uh, uh, when we have the questions in class. Um, so, uh, you know, in our seismic part, we talked about uh, a couple of the uh, elastic properties of uh, of rocks and soils uh, and and fluids like water and air. Um, and uh, we talked, of course, about the uh, P wave velocity, the S wave velocity. Uh, those are rock properties. Um, we talked about uh, uh, another one of the elastic parameters is density. It's it's a, it has to do with uh, seismic wave propagation too. Uh, and um, at least with uh, uh, with gravity, we really only have to talk about density. Okay. Um, you know, we might we might correlate velocities, we might correlate electrical conductivities. You know, other rock properties, age, um, porosity, permeability. We might correlate those with density, but in terms of interpreting the uh, or or modeling or or inverting our um, our uh, Bouguet gravity anomalies. All we're getting at is rock densities, and we may just be getting at density anomalies. Okay, now um, uh, looking at this table here, all right, you can see uh, that uh, uh, you know just like velocity, uh, there's some pretty big ranges of uh, of density for each you know rock type, each sediment type, each uh, soil type. You know, unconsolidated uh, materials uh, naturally, depending on their their consolidation, they have big ranges of density as as well as as other properties. But even like this uh, this clay, um, uh, you know, these are samples of clay of of all kinds from all over the world with all kinds of different uh, 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 you know porosities and and uh, water contents. Okay, but the minimum is you know one point five, which I, I have seen uh, that kind of clay in the field. Um, and uh, you know, at the top end, uh, 2.6, right? Um, so this is not even a factor of two. Okay, even for this, you know, this fairly variable material, you know, and unconsolidated materials are always, you know, at the surface, they're always the most variable. And uh, unlike seismic velocity, right? P velocity, you know, for a, 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 a 
you know, a dusty, loose, dry clay. Uh, I've measured it as low as 200 meters a second, and um, you know, p velocity for uh, uh, for uh, you know ancient clay compressed into shale and metamorphosed a bit. You know, that can be up at uh, even uh, 6.0. Uh, kilometers per second, right? So, uh, you know, there there could be a what is that? A range of um, of uh, thirty, okay. But for clay's density, no, um, small range really, okay. Density is just not that variable, right? It's 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 mass. You can't you can't vary mass uh, by that much, right? Um, so uh, you know, one point five to two point six, right? Okay. Dry sand, you know, maybe right at the crest of Sand Mountain on a, uh, in the middle of a very hot summer, um, you know, with no thunderstorms, uh, we might get, uh, you know, these would be awfully hard to measure, right? Bulk density of, of loose sand uh, could be uh, uh, 1.4, as low as that, uh, and, uh, you know, 1.5. Uh, saturated sand, you know, pretty narrow range, 1.9, 2.1, you know, 2.0 is a pretty good average. Um, you know, there's some very light uh, uh, materials like chalk, and I also want to mention the uh, uh, diatomites we have in, in this area, uh, tertiary uh, lake sediments. Um, and uh, when saturated, they, the diatomites have this range too. But um, uh, you can take a, pick up a chunk of diatomite along uh, West McCarran in the bluffs uh, overlooking the Truckee over there and um, throw it in a bucket of water, it's going to float. And which means what? Its density is less than one, right? Lighter than water. Uh, so uh, you know maybe uh, 0.8 as a minimum there. Um, but uh, you don't have to vary that uh, that uh, uh, chalk or um, or that uh, uh, diatomite uh, very far or for very long before you know all that pore space that was filled with air is now going to be filled with dent water. Of density uh, 1.0, right, and so uh, then it's easy to get the density up into the uh, the 2.2 2.5 range. Okay, so uh, you know even even something as weird and wonderful as diatomite that floats in some situations, um, we don't have to, you know. Okay, so floating diatomite that can have a uh, a range of densities of just a bit more than uh, a factor of two, right? Um, but uh, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, those are outliers. Okay, so within a factor of two is is really pretty safe. You know, light. You know, coal. It's organic. It's very light. Right down to one point three. Um, you know, uh, uh, lignite coal even lighter. You know, basically uh, carbon black. Right, um, but still not as uh, uh, not a huge range of densities. Okay, then we get up into the actual rocks. You know, dolomite, limestone, salt. You know, as I said, salt is light, um, but uh, you know, not not terribly light uh, compared to some of these other things. You know, higher densities in the uh, in the hard rocks, the igneous and metamorphic rocks, right? Um, you know, maybe getting up towards three. Uh, yeah, peridotite, of course. Uh, um, you know, being made up of heavier minerals, you know, maxes out at uh, three point two, maybe three point three. Uh, but to go up above 3.3, you've really got to um, you've really got to um, uh, got to take individual minerals. You know, barite, of course, <coughs> pyrites, galena. Yeah, very heavy minerals. But you know, since when is you know you uh, not very many places you can find a one meter cube of of rock or ore. Uh, that is, you know, more than one percent of any of these minerals, right? So uh, they're not going to play a very big role in the bulk density of the rock. Okay, um, what uh, you know, gold is uh, uh, what maybe uh, um, maybe ten or twenty uh, grams per cc, right? So if you got a lot of gold in the rock, right, it ought to be more dense. But hey, you know, we're talking uh, in Nevada. You know, we might be talking. Uh, uh, you know, fractions of an ounce of gold per ton of rock, right? So, you know, the gold being there is not going to increase the the bulk density of the rock by any any uh, you know in any way measurable amount. Okay, uh, you know, water, oil, you know, they are uh, 
they're they're what's in the pore space, and and uh, you know, so we will have density differences between what's in the pore space and and uh, and and the rock grains, but uh, the matrix grains, but um, uh, that's uh, you know that's all being calculated together and averaged out into into rocks. So you know the whole thing uh, maybe uh, uh, it's you know even if you're if you're talking to me about a a, a very uh, shallow soil density that's one point five okay you know you might be able to prove it to me. Um, but um, in our uh, you know Western Nevada alluvial environments, pretty rare to find that 1.5. Uh, most of the stuff that that we'll be looking at, uh, almost all the all the stuff that we'll be looking at, is going to be between uh, 2.0 on the low end, and and 3.2 on the upper end. Okay, for rocks, for densities that really are going to make a difference to our uh, gravity surveys, right? Um, so um, uh, you know, 2.0 to 3.2, that's less than a factor of two. Okay, density just doesn't vary that much. Now, now, you know that there is a difference, right? So these uh, sediments, uh, you know, sandstone is lighter than granite. Okay, and uh, so the sandstone in the basins, the um, uh, you know, along with a little bit of diatomite sometimes. Uh, the limestone in the basins, you know, that can that can make basins overall less dense than uh, than the surrounding bedrock and the underlying bedrock, and that is where you know that is uh, where we are going to be looking for anomalies, you know, bedrock to basin, and uh, and gravity is the perfect technique. So even though there might be a density difference of of just a couple of tenths of a gram per cc, um, that's enough. And uh, and we can make uh, terrific. Uh, we can get uh, uh, a lot of terrific results um, with that little density difference um, because gravity measurements are so accurate. Now there is this uh, question. You, you know, you need to know a density. Uh, you know, between your data and your measurement, just to reduce the data, right? Um, and and around here we often assume that very standard two point six seven two point seven gram per cc, uh, you know, standard uh, Bouguer reduction density, you know, assuming Sierra and granite is between, between our gravity measurement and the datum down below. Uh, so that, uh, you know, that, that works, but uh, this sensitivity of the Bouguer reduction uh, to, the, uh, to the density, uh, we can actually use in our favor. If we can, if we can uh, survey over a small hill, right, so this is you, you. You want very, very accurate measurements. So you want to be able to do this in you know one go between, you know you don't want to you don't want to have more than uh, you know measure your base station, make all the measurements over the hill, and then come back to the base station. That's that's all you've got time to do. Okay, uh, you don't want the gravimeter to drift. You don't want the base station correction to stand in the way of you getting uh, accurate measurements over that small area. So we're talking a small hill. Um, then uh, what you do is you go through a process of using trial velocities in the Bouguer uh, reduction, okay, um, and uh, uh, you should probably also include the uh, um, include the uh, B and C ring uh, terrain corrections, okay. So you make a you make a reduction to a, an anomaly, and, and of course you include the free air as well as the Bouguer. And uh, you you let's say you try a uh, uh, a higher density um, uh, for uh, you know you try a density that's actually higher than than the density of the bulk density of the rock that's between the measurement stations and your you know the the uh, the height here is the height above the data okay so it's that bulk density that we're we're worried about here and uh, you know here's a trial uh, where the uh, the Bulk density used for the reduction. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you the equation. I still have to show you the equation that does the reduction. Okay, um, but but use a, a density there that's twenty four hundred um, kilograms per cubic meter. That's that's just another way of that's the MKS way of stating density, right? So that would be two point four um, grams per cc. All right, we use two point four, and um, all right, the we know that uh, and, and we make a plot. Right, and we see that our our delta G is mimicking our topography. Okay, 
And so you say, all right, that's that's too heavy. You know, the the mimicking of the topography um, means that uh, you know that's why we have to go up and come down so we can see the topography in the in the gravity result. You know, there could be other biases to this, and you know, maybe the data is going to be on a slant, but we we can recognize that topography there. Um, all right, so we say, all right, the density was too high. Let's try a lower one. I'm sorry, uh, this is a low density, two point four. Let's try a higher density, okay? And so we correct using a Bouguer reduction density of 2.8 grams per cc, okay? And um, uh, and then we see uh, the topography flipped over. You know, we're looking at a negative image of the topography. All right, so that density is too high, okay? And so we try some other densities. You know, 2.5, 2.7, and then finally we converge on 2.6. And uh, the the that particular value, then uh, you know after after we reduce the gravity to uh, Bouguer anomaly, right? Uh, going over that little hill, um, that reduces it to as flat a line as we can get. You know we see the 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 least representation of the topography within our Bouguer anomaly result. Okay, this is called Nettleton's method. And it's a it's a fantastic way of of estimating you know actually getting a measurement of bulk density you know uh, of this whole hill right uh, the trouble is if we if we go take a sample right we're you know we're not a averaging in the density of the or the lack of density of the fractures surrounding the sample we took um, you know we may be missing porosity we may have uh, we may have air in the pore space of the rock instead of uh, instead of water now we try to solve that by Making sure the sa sample is saturated before we measure its density, but you know, in this business, you know, we're using the whole bulk density of the whole hill, and and that's what we get out, okay? And that's what we need to uh, uh, to interpret the gravity data too. I really want to use the Nettleton method going over the Angora um, Ridge, which is a giant uh, moraine. It's it's quite rare that we have a hill that we can use the Nettleton method on that um, is. Uh, uh, you know, basin sediments sticking up in the air, and you know, glacial uh, moraines are 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 a rare and great example of that. And so we really need to use the Nettleton method uh, right around here in South Tahoe for the uh, to get the, the bulk density of Angora Ridge, and that'll give us a clue about the bulk density of the glacial uh, and moraineal sediments that are below the city of uh, of South Lake Tahoe, uh, which is something we'd also like to get. Okay, so the Nettleton method. We can actually, uh, you know, make a bulk density estimate. Okay, so what we get is, uh, you know, we we remove the effect of the topography, we remove the effect of terrain, we remove the elevation above the uh, uh, the datum, and we see the residual uh, gravity anomaly that's due to the residual anomalous density distribution. Okay, so. Uh, uh, you know, now we have a, a, a gravity anomaly, and we can start thinking about how to interpret or model that in terms of an anomalous density. And the way that we're going to do that uh, is kind of suggested by uh, the gravity map on the left and the uh, and the topographic and bathymetric map on the on the right. Um, uh, the the uh, well, in fact, this is a uh, a basin. Uh, this is a, a basin map, okay. Um, so you know, let's take a look at uh, Pyramid Lake here. Uh, Reno's down here at the bottom left of the uh, of the figure, and and here's a um, here's a uh, 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 a map of the gravity on the on the left. Uh, there's Pyramid Lake, and okay, we don't. There's no points, right? I, I really like with gravity maps to to give the measurement points because. Uh, you can see our, you know, the measurement density varies uh, tremendously. Like in Astor Pass here, we have a very dense gravity survey, um, and um, uh, whereas, uh, of course, in Pyramid Lake, we have nothing. Okay, and it, uh, uh, like out here in the uh, in the Virginia Range, you know, hardly any gravity measurements. And then there was this effort uh, done, uh, and and Gary was the one who assembled this data set. Right to have these uh, sort of uh, you know lines of gravity measurement that are radiating around uh, Pyramid Lake, just to get some idea of what the the gravity gradient is going into the lake, where we can't make any measurements and at least give us a 
uh, a little bit of a clue about uh, what uh, uh, what the density uh, uh, I mean sorry what the gravity might be in the lake you know kind of interpolating and projecting into the lake where we where we have not been able to measure it yet so um, uh, that's what was done uh, you can see there's other valleys other places where we're we're lacking gravity measurements but uh, you know we as long as they're out in the lake we'll be able to solve that eventually and um, so uh, uh, what we're looking at here is uh, depth of uh, uh, thickness of sediment below each valley, right? Each notice that that these valleys are are uh, associated with gravity lows. Okay, so we're this is a complete uh, Bouguer anomaly map, right? Actually, it's isostatically corrected as well, but for our purposes, we'll call it a Bouguer anomaly map. And and uh, there are these, uh, you know. Big gravity lows, and they tend to line up with the uh, with the basins that we already know about. Uh, you know these uh, uh, grobbins uh, that uh, are uh, you know all through the the uh, uh, Walker Lane as as well of of course uh, the rest of the basin and range uh, and the and the Great Basin. So um, you know there's clearly some missing density here, and so if we if we have a uh, uh, a grobbin with with relatively light sediment in it, you know, maybe uh, 0.3 grams per cc light, lighter than the uh, bedrock in the in the uh, surrounding ranges. Okay, then we can, uh, you know, what we have on the right here is a um, you know apparent uh, pre-tertiary basement relief. Okay, um, so uh, that's. Um, uh, you know, we're looking at topography, but we're also looking at. Uh, you, you might be able to see the contours in here, that are uh, uh, contours of uh, of uh, um, the uh, uh, you know 200 meter uh, uh, separated contours of uh, basin thickness. And so, under Pyramid Lake, you know, there's this proposal. You know, this is a result that's uh, purporting to show. That uh, there's uh, under the lake, there's that looks like uh, uh, you know maybe two kilometers of sediment, okay, um, you know just under the north end of Pyramid Lake, and so this is really what what we use gravity for the most in this class and and for solving the problems in earthquake hazards. Uh, you know we want to locate those piles of sediments, so we want to locate those basins. Uh, sometimes the basins are volcanic piles that are. Are sitting up in the ranges, like uh, uh, here, uh, this uh, rainbow um, rainbow basin, I think it's called. Um, you know, it's it's up there at the top of the uh, of the range. I forget what that range is called. Uh, the uh, maybe that's the Virginia range, um, but there's a relative gravity low there, and that's because there's a bunch of uplifted tertiary volcanics and sediments uh, that are filling a uh, uh, one of those Trans Sierra. Um, um, uh, valleys, uh, tertiary valleys. So uh, you know the the basin structure may or may not have anything to do with the uh, with the topography, uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why why we have to do gravity work to figure it out. Um, you know we suspect that where we have sediment at the surface or or tertiary volcanics, we suspect that uh, we should have a, a basin, and without drilling it, gravity gives us an estimate of you know how much sediment there is. Okay. Um, you know, of course, we got to confirm that. Uh, you know, eventually we got to drill it, to, uh, but we could confirm it e earlier with uh, perhaps seismic refraction measurements, perhaps magnetic measurements, perhaps uh, uh, you know, airborne uh, magnetotellurics. Uh, all those can contribute to uh, giving us sediment thicknesses. Um, sediment thickness has a lot of uses uh, in earthquake hazards. Something I'm working on right now is figuring out. Uh, um, you know, I need sediment thickness because uh, seismic waves, sediments are also lower velocity, so seismic waves are bouncing around like crazy in these basins, and the, the basins in this area, you know, focus and and uh, uh, the seismic energy as well as um, uh, you know vastly drawing out the duration of of seismic shaking when there is an earthquake. Uh, but another very simple and very common use for uh, you know, uh, for the gravity technique is surveying to find the uh, the gravity lows, and um, uh, you know, in the end, figuring out well, okay, how thick is the sediment? How thick is the alluvium in this particular basin? 
right? And that may, uh, in in many cases, tell you something about um, how um, tell you something about about um, about how thick the aquifer is, right? And that tells you a lot about you know, okay, what are the water resources we have in this in this valley, okay? If uh, you know if the valley is nowhere, the sediment in the valley is nowhere thicker than 100 meters, then you have some pretty limited water resources. Uh, whereas in Reno, you know, there's uh, parts of the Reno Basin uh, way down here on the the left uh, over a pretty uh, pretty decent gravity anomaly and uh, a gravity low, and so there are parts of the Reno Basin that are used for um, you know by uh, the Truckee Meadows uh, Water Authority. For seasonal uh, uh, storage, you know, in, in the form of groundwater, they inject groundwater when the river's flowing well in the uh, in the spring, and then we they withdraw it in the late summer and winter um, when the river is not flowing very well. Uh, and uh, turns out there's parts of the Reno Basin that are more than a kilometer thick, um, and uh, that just increases the uh, the ability Tumwa's ability to uh, store water uh, within the basin. Okay, now I, I promise you this equation. Um, this is worth memorizing, you know, um, just just to do our gravity lab, uh, just to um, uh, you know, just to uh, 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 just to figure out uh, um, uh, you know how we're how we're doing as we as we're surveying uh, our and getting values of gravity. Uh, we also want to start thinking. All right, are we are we starting to out outline any uh, any Bouguer anomalies? Okay, and uh, are we seeing any anomalies? And and uh, uh, you know, so let's put let's put uh, you know our um, you know even though we don't, maybe maybe in the field uh, actually this year we will have very accurate elevations in the field. So we're going to have the opportunity as soon as we make our gravity measurement, we can do the uh, the full reduction. Um, uh, down to uh, the Bouguer anomaly, uh, right there. Um, okay, not the uh, admittedly not yet the uh, um, the total uh, um, not yet the 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 total uh, um, outer ring terrain correction, but uh, you know at least we can get a, a simple Bouguer uh, anomaly uh, uh, right there as we're taking our gravity. Okay, and, and the equation is just this simple. Okay, so. Uh, you take uh, the Bouguer uh, reduction density, okay? Uh, that's rho, and and you know a lot of the work we do around here, that's uh, you know 2.67 grams per cc, and with these constants, you know that that should be in uh, grams per uh, the density should be in grams per cc. Multiply that reduction density by uh, 0.04192, okay, and subtract that from uh, 0 0.3083, right? So if the reduction density is uh, uh, two and a half, then uh, two and a half times 4.04 uh, is going to be uh, is going to be 0 0.1. So we take 0 0.3 and we subtract 0 0.1. Okay, and so you take that factor, right? Um, uh, you know this is uh, point now uh, 0 0.2, right? 0 0.3 minus 0 0.1 uh, is 0 0.3. I'm sorry, 0 0.2, and uh, then you multiply it by the height in meters. Okay, the height above of your station above the uh, above the datum. Okay, and if you're below the datum, which you know that does happen sometimes. You know you haven't set the datum yet, or you set it somewhere and it's a little too high. Uh, then this h is uh, is um, um, is negative, right? If you're below the datum, if you're above the datum as you should be. Then H is positive. Okay, so let's say the you know you're 10 meters above the datum, so you got 0.2 times uh, 10 meters. That's two uh, milligals. Okay, so uh, the uh, the free air and Bouguer slab correction together, the whole elevation correction, is is going to add. You know you're 10 meters above your datum, right? That's all. Only 10. That's not that far up, right? It's going to add two milligals, right? So this is really uh, sensitive to uh, to that measurement of uh, of height. Okay, uh, so that's uh, you know the the Bouguer correction. It's a it's a delta g and it's in milligals. Uh, so you know memorizing this equation is a 
uh, being able to do it in your head at least is a, is a pretty good move. And uh, you know you're not far wrong if you if you take it as uh, uh, 0.2 times uh, uh, your height in meters, right? That gives you the the Bouguer gravity correction in, in uh, uh, the elevation correction in, in milligals. So one fifth. Um, well, we can turn this equation around and figure out our our uh, elevation control requirements. Okay. So if we want a gravity accuracy of say uh, uh, you know one percent of a milligal, which uh, okay, so how ridiculous is that? Could we ever get elevation that accurate? Okay, so uh, we'll put in a uh, uh, um, um, we'll put in a delta g uh, of um, of zero point oh one milligal, one percent of a milligal. Then we just divide by uh, you know this factor. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, the example here uses two grams per cc as the Bouguer reduction density. Okay, then uh, it turns out that we get uh, delta H. Okay, a this you know for that accuracy of 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 uh, you know 0 0.01, we you know we want we want the uh, we want the um, the Bouguer correction. The Bouguer correction, right? It depends on, on a lot of a lot of factors. It depends on data too, right? It, the Bouguer correction depends on the reduction density rho. The Bouguer correction depends on the height, okay? And it, it gives us, you know, we make a sub, we make an addition or subtraction from our uh, our our gravity value in 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 making our our uh, Bouguer anomaly, right? So we. Um, um, you know the 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 amount of the correction could be an error, right? Because it depends on the accuracy of our elevation data, depends on our assumption of, of density, right? So it's going to be an error. We want to minimize that error. So for the first question is, you know, how accurately do we need to uh, uh, to get that that delta H, get that relative uh, elevation, that relative height above the datum? You know, whatever we set our as our datum, we want to. We want to we want to get a height above that, um, you know how accurately, okay? And and if our specification is a dg of one percent of a milligal, then uh, then we need elevations to an accuracy of plus or minus uh, four and a half centimeters, okay? Um, now that's a relative elevation accuracy. So you know if you have line of sight to all of your uh, all of your stations. Um, then uh, and they're all within a couple kilometers. Then a uh, you know a survey with an EDM theodolite will probably uh, will probably solve it to uh, better accuracy than that. Um, but uh, is uh, four and a half centimeters of elevation of, of elevation accuracy available from um, uh, from a handheld GPS? You know, like in your iPhone? Uh, of course not. Okay, you're lucky if. Uh, uh, your elevation accuracy uh, from your iPhone is 10 meters, right? So uh, actually, we can calculate what that'll give us, uh, and I think I did already. Uh, um, uh, it's a, you know, if we if we used our our iPhone elevations, uh, um, you know, which we know are inaccurate by at least 10 meters, right? Uh, if we used our iPhone uh, uh, elevations for our delta H's, right? We could be uh, we could be 10 meters off. And then multiply it by 0 0.2. That means uh, that we have an inaccuracy, an uncertainty in our in our gravity, of two milligals. Now you know if you're surveying a uh, over a relatively large area, and and you're seeing like 20 milligal variations, and that's really what you're modeling. You're not you're not you know down there trying to model the the noise, the 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 two milligal noise. Well. That could work, okay, and uh, and that might be all right, um, but now, especially this year with the uh, with the the the, the government's uh, RTK GPS system, you know, uh, we don't have to live with that uh, uh, ten meter elevation inaccuracy and the resulting two milligal error. We can get this uh, uh, one percent of a milligal, 0 0.01 milligal uncertainty in our in our corrected data. Right, so the, this uncertainty it only comes in when we bring in this uh, this uncertain uh, uh, elevation correction, you know, the Bouguer and free air correction. Uh, it's not an uncertainty in our original um, 
in our original, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, total acceleration of gravity uh, measurement, you know, which we calibrate back to a, uh, uh, you know, we correct for tides, we correct for drift, we, and we uh, we bring it from a, a, a known control point, you know, that's published at uh, the Paces database. Okay, that that has its own inaccuracies. No, this is this is not a. Uh, we don't need elevation control for any of that. Okay, what we need elevation control for is the uh, uh, is 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 for this elevation correction that gives us our Bouguer anomaly. Okay, and and that's that's why we are always doing highly accurate elevation surveys when whenever we uh, we want to measure gravity because. You know, uh, we can't. We just can't accept two milligal um, uh, uh, uncertainty in our gravity in our gravity anomaly results, and that uh, uh, so that uh, explains uh, those factors. And the next lecture is going to be more about uh, how to interpret uh, the uh, the uh, Bouguer anomalies that we've just derived.